السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اما بعد فاعوت بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدری و یسر لي امری وحل العقدة من لسانی یفقه قولی We were learning about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his birth and his early childhood. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was still a baby, he was given in the care of who? Halima Saadiyah. And why was he given in the care of another woman? Good. There were different reasons behind that. Remember that first of all, Makkah was a very busy city. Busy city meaning a lot of visitors and that would mean disease also. So for that reason, Makkans, especially the wealthy ones amongst them and specifically the Quraysh, they would send their little babies, infants literally, where? In the outskirts of Makkah. All right? Because remember that the Arab tribes were of two kinds. One, those who were Hadari. Residents, meaning those who resided in cities. And then there were also Badawi. Badawi, meaning those who lived in the desert. Either they were nomadic or somewhere in the desert they lived. So the Prophet ﷺ, as a child, he was also sent amongst the Badawi tribes and uh, specifically the Banu Sa'ad. All right? in, and he was given in the care of Halima Sa'adiyya. So this was one reason, for his protection, for his health, health and safety. And another reason was that, remember that Makkah, everybody's coming over there, all right, from, from different places. Now think about a very busy place. Do you think that the culture would be affected? The language would be affected? Yes? When a lot of foreigners come into one place, a particular city, a particular group of people, then what happens? It affects their language, it affects their culture. So in order to teach their children the pure Arabic language, what would the Quraysh do? They would send their children to the desert. All right? So that they would learn the pure Arabic language. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he really developed the skill of, of speaking eloquently, briefly, to the point, and clearly. So much so that much later in his life, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet ﷺ did not, did not speak like you do. Like an average person speaks. Really quick, fast, such that you can't even tell between the words, alright, or continuously, non-stop. No, he did not speak like you speak. Rather, he spoke clearly, with distinct words, so that every person who heard him, he could remember those words. And if you think about it, if you look at the different ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, just you're amazed by the words, how easy it is to memorize those words even. Right? Like for instance, the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Look at it. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ It's basically three main words. Alright? And these words can be interpreted in so many different ways. You know this hadith has been understood in at least six different ways, if not more, depending on how you look at B. Alright? So the meaning changes. So many a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the words are brief, they're eloquent, they're meaningful, they're powerful. And this skill he developed at a very young age. Because you know there's something known as word poverty. You know what word poverty is? What is word poverty? What do you think? Yes, fewer words, right? Lack of vocabulary. Because if this is not worked on when a child is young, when, when language skills are not developed at a very young age, then this stays with the person for the rest of their life. Because language expressions, uh, language related skills, when are they developed? At a young age. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ, he was the most afsah, the most eloquent of all people, and part of the reason was that he grew up amongst the Banu Sa'ad, speaking, uh, listening to and speaking the most pure Arabic language. And also remember that life in desert is different. Also life away from family is also very different. Alright? When you are growing up in the house of your grandparents, alright, amongst your uncles and aunts, and everyone is older than you, of course you'll be pampered. Correct? 
and everyone's going to be serving you all the time, how are you going to learn independence? So the Prophet ﷺ, he lived amongst the Banu Sa'ad where he learned to be you know, independent, as we will see inshallah. And also, uh, life in the desert is more difficult. All right, And when you experience difficulty, then that develops strength inside of you. So there were many benefits in the Prophet ﷺ living amongst the Banu Sa'ad. And initially, the Prophet ﷺ was supposed to stay with the Banu Sa'ad under the care of Halima Sa'adiyah for only two years. After two years, as promised, Halima Sa'adiyah brought the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca. But over these two years, she had seen a lot of benefits in having him as part of her family. There was a lot of barakah in her wealth, in her family. So she requested if she could keep him another two years. And the mother, Amina, she allowed. So the Prophet ﷺ stayed for another two years and that was extended to basically, uh, so, and, and basically he stayed with them for four years. Now what happened was that at four years of age, the incident of in Sharh al-Sadr, that happened. All right? And the brothers of the Prophet ﷺ, brothers as in those who were also nursed by Halima Sardiya, they witnessed this incident. All right. They saw that a man came, overpowered Muhammad ﷺ. All right. And this happened while, while all these children were looking after the sheep. All right. Because the Prophet ﷺ, as a young child even, before the age of four, what was he doing? He was working as a shepherd. He was working as a shepherd. Can you imagine a four-year-old boy, a three-year-old boy, looking after sheep? I was thinking if it was my children, they would look at a sheep and scream and run away. Like honestly. But the Prophet ﷺ, I mean, it shows bravery, it shows courage. Right? He's looking after sheep. So while all these children are looking after sheep, what happens? Jibreel comes in the form of a human being, overpowers Rasulullah ﷺ, removes his shirt, cuts open his chest, and imagine, all the children are watching. Alright? And they run and they call Halima Sa'adiya. And by the time they come, the Prophet ﷺ is standing. But his face is all pale. He looks afraid, traumatized. And Jibreel had basically cut open his chest, removed his heart, and removed the portion of shaitan from the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And he had washed his heart with zamzam. And remember that this incident of Sharh al-Sadr happened at this age, but it also happened later on. Again. And when was that? When the Prophet ﷺ was taken for Mi'raj. At Isra and Mi'raj. Now, why was the heart of the Prophet ﷺ washed? Why was the portion of shaitan taken out of his heart? You know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Every person he has within himself, fujur and taqwa. The potential to commit sin, and also the potential to fear Allah and do good. Alright? So, we see that the nafs, the heart, the soul, it is inclined towards evil, and it is also inclined towards good. So what is our struggle in in this life? To purify the heart. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ Purify the heart. And the one who does not purify the heart, وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ The one who suppresses the heart, all right, he does not remove that evil from his heart, then that person is destroyed. All right? Now, the portion of shaitan, what is that? You see, shaitan, in Surah Al-Nas, what do we learn? الَّذِي يُوَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ Shaitan, he whispers into the sadr of the person. What is sadr? Chest. But remember that that waswasa doesn't necessarily reach and overcome the heart. Alright? How is it that it reaches the heart? When you make space for shaitan in your heart. When you do not repel that waswasa. When you accept it. When you take it in. Then what happens? Shaitan makes space in the heart of a person. And then, as we learn, when a person commits a sin, then a black mark appears on the heart. Right? Then that mark with tawbah, with istighfar, it must be washed away. And if it is not washed away, then what will happen? One sin will lead to another sin. And that blackness will eventually cover the heart. Right? So similarly, shaitan, then he makes space in, in the heart of a person. Then he takes control. Then he overpowers the heart. 
and then he rules over the person basically. Because the heart is the king. And if shaitan ruled over the king, then he ruled over the person. Then the hands will do what the shaitan says. And the eyes will watch what the shaitan says. The ears will be interested in listening to what? What the shaitan wants. Then shaitan runs through the blood of the person. He takes over completely. So this portion of shaitan, that was removed from the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his heart was washed with zamzam. Now if you think about it, this process, was it painful? What do you think? Of course it was. Because even though the Prophet sallallahu was perfectly safe afterwards, yani his heart was, uh, his heart was placed back, his chest was, you know, put together, everything was fine, but he was pale. He was frightened. And he must have experienced some pain. It was like an open heart surgery basically. Right? So it must have been painful. What does this show us? That the process of purifying your heart, cleaning your heart, fighting against the waspas of shaitan, is that process easy? It is painful. Because the heart finds pleasure in doing certain things. But what if those things are not liked by a rahman Then leaving those things is going to be a very painful process. You know, this is like when a person is addicted to, for instance, a drug. All right? Leaving that drug, is it easy? Is it easy? Not at all. What happens? People have to go into rehab, right? They need therapy. They need to fight themselves. I have seen myself, a person who went through rehab, and I can tell you, it was the most painful thing just watching that person. Just watching them. How literally they lost control of their body even. They lost control of their body even. Such a painful process to get over this, to leave these bad habits. Now, a drug is something physical. But at the same time, we have spiritual addictions. Spiritual addictions, right? I mean, that, that are related to the heart. So leaving those is also extremely painful. And we see the heart of the Prophet ﷺ was washed with zamzam. Hmm? Because zamzam, it removes ailments. It removes the effect of shaitan. It, it removes the disease of the heart. It removes the filth of shaitan. So we must also use zamzam for purification, for health, for the health of the heart also. So anyway, when this incident occurred, Halima Saadia brought the Prophet ﷺ back to Amina because she was afraid. She was afraid that if this boy dies, if an incident like this happens again, and if he dies, then what will happen? I'll be in trouble. So she brought him back to Makkah and she handed him back to Halima Saadia. And sorry, she handed him back to Amina. And she told Amina about what had happened. And Amina was not surprised. She was not surprised. In a hadith, which is in a, a silsilatul sahiha, we learned that she was not surprised at all. And in fact, she recounted her dream. She remembered her dream. Which dream? That she had when the Prophet ﷺ was born. That she saw light emanating from her. Right? Light that was being cast on even the, the, the palaces or the homes in Asham. So she was not surprised at all. But anyway, Halima Saadia did not feel comfortable taking the Prophet ﷺ with him, even though she loved him dearly. She left him in the care of his family. So the Prophet ﷺ was now back in, back in Mecca. All right. And he was four years at this time. At age six, he visited Medina with his mother and his grandfather, uh, Abdul Muttalib, as well as Umm Ayman. Who was Umm Ayman? The slave woman of his father. All right. And Umm Ayman, what was her name? Her actual name? Baraka. All right. So they all visited Medina. And over here, what happened? The mother of the Prophet ﷺ passed away. She died and he was still six at this time. And at Abwa, basically, she passed away and that is where she was buried. Alam yajidka yatiman. He found you as an orphan, but he sheltered you. 